All right, class, it's time to begin. As always, uh, reminders and announcements to start things off. Uh, you probably know the reminder slash announcement that I'm going to do. Um, homework 2 is on Canvas. Uh, it deals with linear uh, uh, models, or rather, it asks you to kind of invent linear models, linear classifiers that are identical to some other function. Uh, there's some exploration of mistake bound learning. And uh, for your experiments, you'll be implementing Perceptron and its variants. Um, and the usual advice start soon if you haven't already. Um, and uh, you know, use Canvas for discussion. I tried getting Piazza going, but uh, somehow didn't get through to setting it up properly. And uh, it's in an unstable state in my computer right now. And I'm afraid of touching it. Um, so I'll keep working on that, but for now, let's continue using Canvas. And um, please do use Office Art, mine, and the TAs uh, in case you have questions about the homework. Uh, it, this homework is maybe a little easier than the previous one, but not necessarily because it forces you to kind of exercise a different set of muscles, if you will. Um, you'll, be, uh, you'll be working with feature vectors that are not necessarily discrete. And you'll be implementing a learning algorithm that's kind of simple, but you'll be doing a lot more experiments. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's always better to start early. At the end of today's lecture, you'll have all, hopefully all the material you need to uh, uh, for this homework. Uh, and uh, we've decided, uh, we've kind of gotten the ball rolling on the project. We've got uh, all the data and everything set up, but uh, watch out for, you know, it, it's not public yet. Watch out for an announcement on projects uh, sometime tomorrow morning. Any questions? Any questions on homework? Yes. Uh, the second homework is mistake bound learning part. Um, it's just like mistake bound learning algorithm. Can we use one that's very similar to what we did in class? Does it really need to be like a whole new algorithm? It can be uh, 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 something similar to what's in the class. Um, basically, our uh, you know, I am not asking you to invent an algorithm from scratch that nobody has ever seen before, right? Uh, so it, it, you can build on top of what we saw in class. Other questions? Questions about the linear models, questions about implementation. Have people started the homework other than you? Apparently you did. Do you have a question? No. Oh, you started the homework. Yes, <laughs> good. One person started the homework. Okay, yes. Please start soon uh, if you haven't already. Um, it, it, it could take some time to run these things. That's why. Other, any other thoughts? Yeah. Uh, for, for average, that yes. Okay. okay. That's a good segue um, into uh, what we're going to cover today. We, we are going to continue from where we left off. We were looking at the perceptron algorithm, and uh, I kind of briefly just went over the history of the algorithm and uh, introduced this simple process. I'm going to start here again. Today, we'll see why this is a reasonable thing, at least intuitively, why this makes sense. Then I'll talk about some variants of the perceptron algorithm that uh, tend to be a little bit more robust. And uh, my hope is that uh, we get done with the, uh, a theorem uh, proving a theorem that shows that the perceptron is a mistake bound algorithm. Uh, it's a lot to cover, but uh, hopefully we get through all of it. So briefly, quickly uh, uh, recapping what we saw with this algorithm. The perceptron algorithm operates on inputs that are that you can assume are already given to you as feature vectors. So we'll call them x1, which is for the, uh, the a vector in, in X i's are all vectors in D dimensions. And the y i's, y1, y2, these are labels which can be minus one or one. So we have a binary classification problem. And uh, the way this uh, operates is it internally keeps track of a set of weights that it keeps updating whenever there's a mistake. In the end, it learns a linear threshold unit, a linear classifier. Just as a reminder, a linear classifier takes one of these x i's and predicts. Uh, um, a one if w is a linear classifier has weights w and it predicts a one if w transpose x 
is greater than or equal to zero. In writing that, I'm implicitly assuming that one of the features in X is a constant, which is called the bias feature. And uh, that way we don't have to keep track of the, the B, the, the bias uh, weight that uh, we have to, you know, that comes along. So internally it keeps track of these weights that it initializes with zero as we'll, uh, in your homework, I ask you to, I will, I have asked you to initialize your weight to some small random number, uh, just to kind of, uh, you know, move, you know, change things up a bit. But in the original version that uh, we'll see here in class and that we'll analyze, the weights are initialized to zero. And the learning process is very, very simple. It's a mistake driven algorithm. You have a sequence of examples that keep coming along. And for every example, xi comma yi, xi is the input feature vector, yi is the label. First, you make a prediction. The prediction here is uh, uh, exactly to see if w transpose xi is greater than zero. If so, then the label is plus one, else it's minus one. In other words, the prediction is uh, the sign of w transpose xi. We call that y prime. y prime is essentially what the perceptron guesses the label is for this current example. And then it checks, did it make a mistake? If yi is not equal to y prime, then it makes an update. And this is the perceptron update right here. The perceptron update is simply saying, if your mistake is a mistake on a positive example, then you add the, the input features to the current weight, but scale it by an r. If your mistake is a mistake on a negative example, then you subtract the input features, but scale it from, by r. Compactly, you can write that as wt, wt plus one is wt plus r times yi xi. So yi is minus one or one. So if it's a positive example, it's adding. If it's a negative example, it's subtracting. And this is it. This is deceptively simple. That's all there is. Every time you make a mistake, you add or subtract the, uh, the, the, the feature vector of that input uh, uh, with the to the current weights. As a sort of a technical note or a note of implementation, this plus here is vector addition. So if you are adding two vectors here, which is why it might be easier in your implementation if you are using Python to consider, not necessarily required to consider using something like NumPy, because it can it treats vectors as a first class uh, object. And you can just say w is w plus x. And then you keep doing this till you run out of examples, at which point you're done and you just uh, return the final weight factor. Now, this is the simplest version of the perceptron update. Here are uh, a few sort of technical points to note. The r that we uh, have here is uh, called the learning rate. And it is asking how much does this example influence the final weight? Sometimes it's called the step size in uh, certain other algorithms also. And uh, another uh, thing here is these two steps together can be compactly written as if yi times w transpose xi is negative. If that's the case, then you make an update. And I kind of spent a bit of time in the last lecture describing why uh, this is valid. Any questions? Any questions about the algorithm? Yes. So I've already attempted Good. And the labels that are present are zero and one. Yes. So you say when you're in a group, what you're doing is going one by zero. No. You, you need to change that. Really, that, that's a very good point. The labels in the homework are zero and one, but for perceptron, the negative label should be minus one. And uh, this is such a small detail. I don't mean to trip you up by doing this. Maybe we can just update the homework files and uh, uh, the data files to give you a version where the negative is minus one. Uh, could one of you just remind me later? Uh, it's a tiny detail, but good catch. Because if you multiply by y when y is zero, then you do, you do nothing for a negative example. So mistakes on negative examples are free. And we don't want that. Good catch. Other questions? Okay, um, you know, it's one thing to just see an algorithm, but it's worth thinking about why this makes sense. You know, I, I can invent why, why is it that uh, 
W plus uh, X is the right thing to do for a positive a mistake on a positive example, and W minus X is a good thing to do for a mistake on a negative example. To see that, let's consider. Let me see if I can give you a bit of. Yes, there's a question. So this T on the waves is that based on every train example? No. Uh, uh, there are there's no concept of an epoch yet. T is essentially indexing the Ws. So it's this is a sort of a weird notation, uh, admittedly, but you do see this. It's it's convenient for the proof as we'll see. It's just to keep track of a sequence of waves. So perceptron algorithm can be seen as going through a series of weight vectors, starting with the zero vector. And that is the, the, the T is essentially indexing that. This is just there so that the proof that we'll see is slightly easier to write. Yes. And this T will always be people who are smaller than I, right? So that that's right. That's right. In fact, in your implementation, you would not even have the T. In your implementation, the version that you would implement might be something like. Um, I'm going to try to write code here, and it's always a bad idea to write code on a slide, but hey, why not? For xi, comma yi in the data, if yi, so w is initialize your w. There's no subscript t here. Initialize your w to the zero vector. If this is negative, then w plus right so there is no t to keep track of we don't need to remember all the weights that we encountered unless you care about it in your implementation you don't need that and by the way this code is not going to compile for or if for obvious reasons Okay, um, let's uh, let's look at why this is a reasonable thing to do. So, just to remind you, um, if there's a mistake on a positive example, we are adding the input features. If there's a mistake on a negative example, we are subtracting the input features. Suppose we have a positive example. So let's say that we have an example. Uh, let's call it x i and y i is plus one, and the current uh, weight vector w t has made a mistake. What does it mean to make a mistake? It means that the current model predicts that this example should have a negative label. When will it predict that it has a negative label? When WT transpose X is negative, right? So currently what we have is the, the given example has a positive label, but the, the dot product of the weights and the features is negative. Sometimes, uh, this quantity here is also part of the score for the example. And this is a generalization. This is a useful sort of a concept to keep in mind. Essentially, we are assigning a score to each example. If the score is positive, we are calling it the example uh, positive. If the score is negative, we are saying the example is negative. So what we have here is the true label, sometimes called the gold label, the ground truth is plus one. And the predicted label is negative because the score is negative. So what, what happens then? We construct a new weight vector. So we call upon this part of the update rule because it's a mistake on a positive example. We construct a new weight vector, WT plus one, which is WT plus X. I'm pretending here that the learning rate R is just one so that we don't have to worry about that other extra term. So we have WT plus X. And now we can ask, originally WT transpose X was negative. We can ask, what happens to the score after the update? So old score, the old score is uh, negative. We could ask what is the new score is WT plus one transpose X. Or did, did I have an XI here? Eh, I don't have an XI in the example. So I could ask what happens to the score after the update, right? In a perfect world, what do you want the score to become? Originally, the score was negative. That was a mistake. What do you want the new score to be? Positive. Why? Because this example is a positive example and the 
we want the score to be positive. And that way, it's not going to make a mistake on this example anymore. Is that, uh, does that make sense? So any algorithm that makes this quantity positive or even less negative would count as a win. So that, let's see what happens. So WT, trans, WT plus one transpose X, well, WT plus one is simply WT plus X. I can open up these uh, the parentheses. So it is WT transpose X, something that we know was negative. And then this X transpose X, X transpose X is simply the squared norm of the vector. It's a square, which means this quantity is positive. We don't care that this was negative yet. So this quantity, the second term here is strictly positive, strictly greater than zero. That means what has happened is WT transpose X is greater than WT plus one transpose X is greater than WT transpose X. The score has increased. So if your original score was some negative number, this quantity is a less negative number because you're adding something positive. Eventually, hopefully, if you see, if you make enough kind number of mistakes, there's only so many positive things you can add that, uh, you, you know, you'll, before this quantity becomes positive. Yeah. So will updating like this cause you to miss class by things that you've already classified correctly in the past? That's a good uh, observation. Why do you say that? Well, I'm, I'm not sure if it will. I'm, I'm wondering. Well, it seems like it would result in that case. Why? Because you're making things more positive here. And there, I don't know, I guess the way I see it, there's nothing guaranteeing that everything in the past will stay directly classified when you update it. That's very good. Two good points, actually, there. I don't know if you realize you made two good points. Uh, <laughs> the first one is by updating on this one example, it's entirely possible that something else that was correctly predicted before is now going to be a mistake. It, there's no reason, at least at, without a theorem, we have no reason to believe that's the case. That's the first good point. The second good point that you made was, all we know is WT plus one transpose X is greater than or equal to WT transpose X. We do not have anything that shows that this quantity is greater than zero. Right? Imagine, for instance, this quantity here was negative 1,000 or 10,000, and this thing here is uh, just, say, plus 10. Adding 10 to negative 10,000 is going to make it less negative, sure, but it's not going to be positive. So there's no guarantee that after the update, even that one example that we just saw will be correctly classified. Did, was there a question somewhere here? Yeah? So how do you choose the learning rate? Do you choose it to be large oscillation? Yes. If you choose it too small, then it's exactly you can. If you choose it to be too small, this uh, yeah. it's going to inch towards the thing. Exactly. It's like take too long. So what, what, is, what is the view going on? Like, you just trial and error some stuff? Or well, the, there's a better name for trial and error. It's called cross-validation. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's what you do in your homework. You use anytime you have these hyperparameters. Hyperparameters are not quantities that control the classifier. The weights control the classifier, right? The weights control the behavior of the classifier. Hyperparameters hyper control how we find that classifier. Anytime we have hyperparameters, a good thing to think about is cross validation. Cross validation allows you to kind of, in an unbiased fashion, in a, that's a technical term, in an unbiased fashion, identify what hyperparameter combinations are good. And so you, in your homeworks, are going to be doing a lot of cross-validation. Anyway, so what the perceptron algorithm does here is for a positive example, it increases the score assigned to this input. I'll leave it as an exercise for you to prove to yourself that a similar reasoning also applies for negative examples. In fact, I highly recommend you do that because it uh, kind of makes you think about the same kind of revisit the sequence of steps, but with one difference. If you don't like algebra uh, and like pictures, let's see if we can. I can convince you with uh, a hand wavy proof by pictures. Imagine 
that we have this weight vector. Remember that the weight vector, the perceptron is learning a linear classifier, which means you're learning this hyperplane uh, in the n-dimensional space. Of course, I can't draw n dimensions on a screen. I can only draw two. So in the two-dimensional space, you're learning a line. The perceptron algorithm may be in before making any update, let's say its its current weights are this W old, and um, the arrow here is the normal to that weight vector. Okay, this is the current state of affairs. A new positive example comes in. Positive examples are also points in the space, right? So I have this point here x, which has a label minus one. Now there are multiple ways of showing that this example is going to be misclassified. One way that's kind of rather intuitive is if the normal to the weight vector points in the wrong direction from the, uh, you know, the normal points in this direction. So every point here is going to be classified as positive, which means this point is going to be classified as negative. Another way of thinking about it is you're thinking about the dot product here. So you can also think about the angle between these two. The angles more than 90 degrees you get a negative uh, value one way or another this example is going to be classified as negative so we trigger the perceptron update we have a positive example we made a mistake so the the remember that the update is w old or w new is w old plus x i'm assuming that the learning rate is equal to one this is a vector and this is a vector so we are doing vector addition here and uh, want you to kind of remember how you draw vector addition uh, whenever you uh, learned about these things you know you um, we have to do this so y is positive then you can you attach the tail of an arrow to the head of something you know there's some silly rules that people remind you of but essentially this is you can call it the parallelogram rule or something like that um, i'm moving this point here to this, this thing uh, just transporting that and so the vector sum is simply this vector here. So the new weight vector has changed. But when the new the weight vector, remember, is normal to the, uh, the sorry, the, the arrow there is normal to the weight vector. So what has happened is this, this line here has rotated so that it goes like this. So the perceptron update essentially in the high dimensional space rotates the line so that the new examples are classified correctly. Rotate the hyperplane so that the new examples are classified correctly. Let's do this again one more time for negative examples. Um, you have a weight vector that points this way. And let's say we have a mistake on a negative example. So this was a this time, this is a negative example. It should have been classified as minus, but remember, note that this, the point and the weight vector are pointing in the same direction. So this side is classified as plus. So we now subtract the weight, the, the example from the weights. So the negative of this vector points in this direction. So that's what this is. And you get a new vector that points like this. And yeah, so the, the weights are rotated again. I've kind of gone through this process in a rather tedious fashion, but I hope one of these examples kind of illustrates what what's happening here. Any questions? Let me do one more thing. Um, a former TA of mine, uh, Georgi, put together an animation showing how the perceptron works in high dimensional space. So let's see if I can. Oh. Okay, now I'm going to do something dangerous. Let's see if this. Um, so folks on Zoom, I'm going to change your screen sharing. And if this works, that's good. If not, I may have to set up the class again. So this is an animation that shows how the perceptron algorithm operates. You have you have red examples and blue examples, and you have some weight vector that corresponds to this line that's separating these two regions. 
And the only things that are going to be shown in this animation are the mistakes. So every blip is a mistake. And every time there's a mistake, the weight vector is kind of moving around, which means the separating the separator between the positives and the negatives are also moving around. And notice that it, it's possible for the, the learner to make mistakes over and over again, but eventually it seems to be converging towards something good. And eventually it gets to almost perfect accuracy, but I think when Georgi set this up, he added some noise to the data so that you will never get perfect accuracy. So this will keep bouncing between a few uh, things. A few weight vectors. I'll just run this once again so that you can see it from the beginning. And as you're looking at it, I want you to think of questions. Yes. We should. Without bias, all we are doing is rotating the weight around the origin. Yes, in this case, the bias is explicitly there because the data points are two dimensions and there is no bias feature explicitly. So what there is going to be a bias feature, which is a constant one. So if you have two dimensional examples, you need to add a single one, a constant one to every example. And that becomes the bias feature, but then the data points are going to be in three dimensions. So with the bias feature, the hyperplane is going to rotate around the origin in the three dimensional space. But in two dimensions, it's going to be doing exactly what's done here. Yes. So like on a homework, we're learning noise in the data like this. Um, I would be shocked if there isn't. Okay. So I want to just stop in. In your homework, it's 20 epochs. <laughs> uh, but uh, in reality, the stopping condition is another hyperparameter that's usually uh, tuned. Um, you know, the, the, you need to decide. We'll talk about stopping uh, later, but you could treat it as a hyperparameter, or you could keep track of error on a held out data set and decide to stop when the error stops uh, kind of getting out of hand. You know, it kind of goes down and then goes up again, at which point you say that, yeah, you know, I should have stopped a little while back. So that's another way of doing that, or you just let it run for as long as you can, uh, however much time you have. But for the homework, just let for the sake of consistency, it's just 20 epochs. Yes. Well, at the end, it seems like it's looking at the same examples close to the center over and over again. Why is that? Uh, that's because of a theorem called the perceptron cycle theorem, which says that if a, a data set is not linearly separable, the perceptron will keep bouncing between. Uh, those are the only mistake, examples that will cause it to make a mistake. And as a result, those are the only uh, uh, instances where the weight will get weight will change. So it will seem like those are the only two weights that will show up. So the cycling theorem says that if the data is not linearly separable, the perceptron will cycle through a set of weights infinitely. And it's keeping track of the ones that it's getting wrong. It's not keeping track of anything, but it keeps updating the weights internally. In, in, it's keeping track in the sense of uh, the it's updating the weight vector. Yes. Can you say that again? What does the epoch Oh, I haven't uh, talked about epochs. We'll talk about that right away. Yes. Um, other question? I thought I saw another hand somewhere. Anyway, this is this animation is kind of fun. And this sort of animation is fun to make for or think about for other learning algorithms that we encounter, where we see examples, make an update, and think about how does each example change the decision boundary. This here is an example of a decision boundary, the boundary between uh, which regions are positive and negative. Okay, uh, let's go back to the regularly scheduled events. Oh, nice. I hope the animation was much better than this sort of cartoon example I've drawn here. Because um, the cartoon example, yeah, you can only do so much with PowerPoint. Let's now look at uh, uh, a few variants of the perceptron algorithm. Hopefully, all of you have some sense of 
what the algorithm, or just the mechanics of the algorithm and an intuition for why it works. Um, so in, in a more realistic setting, we never have an infinite stream of examples that keep coming our way. All we can, the best we can hope for is we have a large data set, but it's still going to be fixed. So then the question is, what can you do with a fixed data set, with a finite data set, when you don't have an infinite stream of examples? So we'll look at that. That's the first point that we look at. Uh, was there a question? Here? No? So uh, if you have a, the second thing to think about is, I'll, I'll introduce an idea called voting and a variant of the perceptron called the voted perceptron, which is which comes with strong theoretical properties and an approximation of the voting idea called averaging or the average perceptron. Then I'll introduce something called the margin perceptron, which is another variant which uh, tends to have good generalization behavior. So let's get started with one thing at a time. The version of the perceptron algorithm that we saw so far and the version that was introduced by Rosenblatt is, uh, is an online algorithm. One example comes in, you make a uh, uh, prediction, you make an update if necessary and toss it out and you maybe never see it again. In practice, we need to, we have a finite data set. So how do we simulate this? One thing we could do is we have a finite data set. We can keep iterating over the data again and again and again to kind of keep getting an infinite set of examples. You can run, you can, you, it doesn't make sense. You have a list of 10 things, if you iterate through that list of 10 things infinitely, you have an infinite list of things. The infinite list of the same 10 things, but that's a different point. So that's the intuition though, for uh, uh, going from the online algorithm to what is called a batch algorithm. A batch algorithm is one where we are given a data set and we need to uh, you know, construct the, uh, we need to build a model using that. And what I, what I have shown here is, uh, typical sort of an online to batch conversion scheme where we take the batch of data and we iterate over it again and again um, using that online update rule. So let's go through this uh, 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 in a little bit of detail. You, you have a finite training set B, a set of uh, examples XI and YI. And as before, each example is uh, a D-dimensional vector and each uh, label here is a minus one or one. We keep track of uh, a weight vector as before, and uh, this is the weight vector that we will eventually uh, return. We initialize it to zero. Learning now, it keeps iterating over the data again and again. Each iteration over the data is called an epoch. That answers your question. Every time you iterate over the data, it's called an epoch, and we call this, um, let's say we have, uh, we, we are, the goal is to do this, for t time, for t epochs. So we have to iterate over the data t times. In each epoch, we're going to enumerate all the examples and apply the perceptron rule. But before that, it's a good practice to just shuffle the data. The reason you shuffle the data is because otherwise every epoch goes through the examples in the same order. And that might introduce certain biases in the model, which may hopefully shuffling, shuffling will get rid of. So it, if you always shuffle the data at the start of every epoch. You shuffle the data, and now step two here is the good old perceptron update. We enumerate every example, and for each example, if there's a mistake, if yi, w transpose xi is negative, then we update the weight. How do we update the weight? We use the update rule. w is w plus r times yi xi, the same perceptron update rule that we had before. T here is a hyperparameter to the algorithm um, that we need to decide. One way of doing deciding what T is, is uh, anytime you see a new hyperparameter, think cross-validation. So you could use cross-validation to decide uh, this thing. And I mentioned this earlier and also talked about this in the last lecture, why I W transpose XI less than zero or less than or equal to zero is just another way of saying there is um, there's an error. as a technical detail in your implementation. And this, there's a tiny little bug here in this code, in this pseudo code, there's a tiny little bug. I'll tell you what the bug is, but I won't tell you why there's a bug. This, if, if I put less than equal to here, I claim that the final weight vector will be the zero vector. 
And if I put strictly less than, then the final weight vector will be whatever I want, will be the one that perceptron returns. Think about this question. This is a good question to think about. And also, it's a very common mistake that people make, including professors on flights. Um, any thoughts, any questions? Now, one thing that I've not talked about is what do you do with this weight vector? Remember, this is also producing a linear classifier. And on a, when you want to actually use this model on new data, on previously unseen data, we treat this like every other linear classifier. In other words, we were given a new example that we've not seen before, if we call it X, prediction is simply sine of W transpose X. Just because we change the learning algorithm slightly does not mean we're going to change how prediction works. There was a question? Yes. In each epoch, you take all the data. Yes. There's no reason to because why then why do you want to not use up data? You could try it. Uh, there are sort of technical reasons for why it's better to take all the data. Yes. In cross validation, all your data is only all the training data. But that's, yeah. The, the cross validation step happens in your choice of this data D. Even before we start the algorithm, we have left out one slide. Yeah. I have another question I have. Okay. If we shuffle the data here, mm -hmm. it makes it to the results there. Is that better? Uh, Oh, you mean there's some randomness in the output? Yeah, so that's a very good point. So we're shuffling the data. Shuffle involves using a random, uh, you know, there's a, there's a random process here. So it's possible that if I write, implement this algorithm and you implement this algorithm, we may, and both of us run the thing and both of us have the right implementation, we may see different weight vectors at the end. We may see slightly different predictions at the end even. And that is expected. What is, uh, uh, so there are two ways to get around that. Oh, actually there's even something even worse, which is even your own algorithm, you run it today, you get one answer, you run it tomorrow, you could get a different answer because this, you have a random uh, shuffling inside. So to make sure that your results are reproducible, namely that you are not so unlucky that when you ran it, the random number generator worked and you got the, 95% accuracy, and when the TA ran it, you just were so unlucky that you it picked a sequence of it, it. You know the shuffling was off, and they only get 50%. That's not going to happen. Uh, but you know to kind of avoid any sort of discrepancies between what you see today and what you see tomorrow, in your implementation, it's important to set the random seed. Uh, every programming language has a way of generating random numbers shuffling lists and all that. And every programming language that has a random number generator also has a way of setting the random seed. Look up how to do that in your preferred language. In Python, there is, it's well documented. You should look it up. But if you set the random seed, your code is reproducible. That still doesn't affect the, doesn't mean that um, your code and my code are going to be identical. Maybe I choose a different random seed. I set the random seed to one, you chose, it, you chose 42. So, our results might be slightly different, but with very, very high probability. In fact, when I say very high probability, I, I mean almost definite certainty, our results won't be too far off from each other. They'll be almost identical. So while grading, we will not be looking for an exact number. I don't want you to, I don't care about, you know, there won't be like a 97.1% accuracy. If you get that, you get full points, otherwise you get zero. No, it's gonna be more like in a small window around the, the uh, expected number that uh, you get. So in practice, what we can do is, uh, what we will do is we'll run a, a bunch of your code and look at the uh, mean of the class. And anyone who goes outside of one standard deviation will get penalized. Did you have a question? Anyone, I, saw, I thought I saw a hand here, but no. Okay, other questions about this? Another variant of the perceptron um, is called, uh, involves this idea of voting. Voting is, uh, or voted perceptron is something that you don't see in practice. 
it's just this sort of a theoretical idea that is uh, uh, that's kind of intriguing and it leads to uh, a heuristic called averaging that is a robust variant of a perceptron remember that in this version by the way this is i called i put standard in quotes because when people implement the perceptron algorithm this is what they implement because uh, typically this is what we have finite data for. so in the standard algorithm we keep we initialize a weight and we keep updating it and we finally return that weight right now so in if you consider the following situation suppose you run this algorithm and you keep track of a bunch of uh, uh, you know you, you encounter a bunch of examples and every time you make um, a mistake you make an update and then you finally return the weight now let's say that we have we are in the last epoch of this process so we are in epoch number t and we have encountered uh, let's say our data set has a thousand examples and we you know at, at example number 500 or our, our, the model makes a mistake, so we make an update. So we get a current weight vector. And then from example 500 to example 1000, every single example is predicted correctly. So there are no updates. And then the last one at 1000, there's another update. Okay. So now the question is um, which of these weights is better? Is the last one better or the one that survived 500 examples without a mistake better? Let me rephrase the question. Imagine that what we have here is a sequential process where, uh, let me maybe draw a picture. We have a sequence of examples. So every time we make an app. So each point here is an example and the circles could represent mistakes. So there's a mistake here. So this weight vector, let's call this W0, has not survived even one example. Then it goes to W1. Then W1 makes a mistake here. So it has survived one, two, three, four examples. So this is W2. And then W2, let's say, survives all the way till here. There's a mistake here. And then W4 goes here. So during the process of learning, we have encountered five different weight vectors. Among these, this W2 seems to have survived the longest during training. And it almost seems like we were doing well until suddenly this W3 came along and ruined things for us and then W4. So it's not, and maybe W4 survives one more time. Okay? And that's the one that you return. Which of these weight vectors is preferable? And instead of say these many examples, let's say this had a million instances without making a mistake and then W3 and W4 survive only one example without making a mistake. It almost seems tempting to say W2 is better because W2 has survived whatever that number is, a million examples without making mistakes. But because of this unfortunate uh, sort of a sequence of events where our random seed ruined it for us, these two examples came along and just forced us to get rid of W2. So wouldn't it be nice if we could return W2 instead of W3 or instead of W4? This is the intuition that uh, the voted perceptron tries to capture. What the voted perceptron says is, instead of just returning the one weight vector, you return this in all these weights that you encounter during training. So the algorithm returns W0, W1, W2, W3, and W4, all of these. And for each of these, it also keeps track of how many examples did it survive before the update came along? So W0 survived zero examples. W1 survived one, maybe, yeah. Um, w, no, so W1 did not survive one. W1 survived three, W2 survived, oh, my pencils. Three, a million things, one and one. So for every weight vector, we also keep track of how many examples it survived before it got updated. When a new example comes in, what we do is we don't make a prediction using the final weight vector. Instead, we ask all of them for what do you think is the answer? What do you think is the label? So maybe W0, W0 says the label's plus one. The W1 says label's minus one. W2 says plus one and so on. So all of them 
get uh, asked for the label, but each one of them get as many votes as it survived. So W2 gets a million votes, W3, W1 gets only three votes. And so these voted, uh, so all, and then these votes are tallied, and then the final result is whatever is the majority label. This idea is called a voted perceptron. You could apply this idea of voting for any classifier. It doesn't have any classifier where you are sequentially updating things. This, the voted perceptron comes with strong theoretical guarantees um, about generalization. Remember, the goal of learning, what we have this sort of a batch of examples, the goal of learning is to generalize to future examples. So voted perceptron comes uh, with strong guarantees. Unfortunately, it's a lousy algorithm to implement because here I have only five weight vectors to keep track of. Imagine that you are keeping track of, you know, your data set is so big that you have 500 million weight vectors that you keep encountering. All of those have to be remembered and every one of them has to be consulted for every new example. So it's not a great, uh, uh, it's not a great, a very practical thing to do, but it's a intriguing idea. Any thoughts, any questions? Yes. Uh, I guess like the one downside I see to this is like if you come through a lot of iterations that uh, uh, will take up a lot of memory. Yes. So you kind of that's probably more your limitation. That's really the limit. That, well, that and the fact that at test time you have to ask each one for its label. Yeah, sure. So there's also a time issue here. Shouldn't shouldn't there be a way to code getting correctness to and adding length to the weight vector so that shifts like if you get a like you have a million examples where you get it right and so you keep adding them. So you keep the weight vector and then if you get it wrong it just like shifts a tiny bit because then you keep subtracting the way. Congratulations you just invented average perceptron. So it turns out that's not exactly the same, but it captures that intuition. So let me kind of, uh, that's a good segue. I don't know if you saw the slide before, but it's a good segue because that's literally the next thing I want to talk about. Instead of using all the weight vectors, we can use an average weight vector such that the longer surviving weight vectors are given more weight, are given more importance. And uh, this is a more practical alternative and it's very widely used. In fact, it's uh, so widely used that it also made it into your homework. So let me kind of go through this in a little bit of detail. Um, it, it looks almost the same as the perceptron algorithm. Um, we have a training set, a set of examples, and we have uh, the labels are uh, minus one or one. We have an initial weight vector W, uh, which is the zero vector. In addition, we keep track of a second vector called A. A is just the average. Here I'm calling it the average, but I'm just going to do the sum because the denominator is not going to matter for the average. We literally go through the same process again, but we uh, iterate over the data multiple times, in this case, k times. So we have t epochs. In each epoch, first we shuffle the data. And then uh, this block here is your, uh, it almost looks like a perceptron update. For every example, uh, if the weight vector w makes a mistake then you make an update and after for after having seen this is a part of the same this whole thing is inside the for loop so after having seen possibly made an update or not you have a current weight vector you add it to the average you add it to the vector a and in the end you don't return w but you return a what it does is Weights that survive longer keep getting added into the average more. Weights that survive only once influence the average much less. And this is uh, basically what, uh, I don't remember your name, Carl uh, suggested. You keep accumulating and then if there was one mistake, it slightly turns the, the, uh, the hyperplane, but the added weight of all these other instances where the, the, the original weight vector survived is going to, make, going to make sure that the final tiny change is not going to matter much. This is not identical to voting. It is slightly different. There is a, you can think about the difference offline. But in practice, this tends to work 
better than the perceptron algorithm. So whenever I use perceptron and average perceptron, I expect average perceptron to do at least as well and often slightly better than the perceptron algorithm. Importantly, because my final, the thing that the average perceptron returns is the vector A, my final prediction is uh, looking at the sign of A transpose N. Questions? Questions? Yes. Yes. You only return one vector and not the entire set. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've asked questions before. I've not heard your voice, so let's go. Oh, uh, yeah. We're, we're saving average. I yeah, so really I need to be returning A divided by number of something. But in practice, that number is a positive number and if the only thing that matters is the sign, why bother counting? So it's not necessary to. So in, in theory, you need to return A divided by the number of uh, times you update the A. Um, I saw you first and then you, so let's so that was my first question. My second one was, how do we keep updating the future? We don't. This, this part, once learning is done, you're done. We don't make any updates after the learning phase. This is a batch algorithm. It's similar to for your decision tree. How do you update your decision tree after learning is done? You don't. Yes. And what is the difference in, uh, in relation to data analysis about it's not necessary here. The normalization makes the eventual theorem work look nicer. Um, but I don't, I have never normalized it in my implementations. Other thoughts? I saw a half raised hand. You can ask a question. It's okay. Um, if you have like a ton of data, and you're updating a, a ton. Like, is there a point where you're worried about floating point? Oh, that's such a good floating? question. I love that. Uh, I have run into that problem. Um, so yeah, uh, where this is going to give you grief is imagine. Let's just make up some numbers. Let's say t is a million. I hope T is never a million, by the way. In any practical setting, your number of epochs is not going to be a million, but let's pretend it's a million. And let's say the size of the data is uh, also a million. So we are doing like a million times a million uh, updates. Eventually, maybe this the, the weights are going to add up so much that the A vector is going to cross the limits of what your floating point numbers can hold. And that can happen and that does happen. And to pre avoid precisely that, you have to kind of hack around and make your code robust to that. It's tedious. Um, I want you to think about it offline. There's a neat extension to the averaging algorithm where this update, instead of keeping it there, you, uh, you, you initialize another vector B. That, uh, I used a B, right? So let's call it V. And Update V only when there's a mistake after you update W. And then you construct an A at the end using the V. And that's where the normalization and such things also come into play so that you never let it grow out of bounds. There are a few, honestly, little dirty hacks and some cute uh, programming optimizations that can allow you to get around it. But of course, if in the limit, there's no guarantee that you will not hit that bound. The thing to keep in mind is your final prediction is not does not care about the scale. This A transpose X or 100 times A transpose X have the same sign. A million times A transpose X has the same sign. So we can, in some sense, shrink the data so that it fits inside. It doesn't hit those limits. But that's a good question. It, uh, it can lead to technical issues and Honestly, those are the worst bugs, bugs to fix. So this is the simplest version of average perceptron. As I said, there are some programming tricks so to make sure that A is updated only when there's an error, and yet you get an identical uh, you know, behavior. Um, if you want, you can think about it, or if not, come, to, come ask me in office hours. I can point you to a place where it's written up. And uh, 
general rule of advice if you want to use a perceptron algorithm always use averaging if you are always if you are basically getting like a 1% improvement for free then why do you, why why not take it right it's almost free you just have to have to add one extra line the third variant of the perceptron algorithm that i want to discuss is called the margin perceptron um, the perceptron algorithm makes a mistake when y times w transpose x is negative so again there's the same mistake here this should be strictly less than negative um, so in other words when y and w transpose x have the wrong sign so what if y times w transpose x is negative but uh, it's positive let's say but it's a tiny 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 positive number so w transpose x is the score for the example if the score is positive then the label is plus but what if, what if for a what if the uh, y times w transpose x is maybe 0. 0.000001 10 power minus 100 let's say it's it's really close to zero but not quite zero it's a positive number the original perceptron algorithm says the positive number no update no mistake no update but we can be smarter than that we could pick another a positive number eta eta could be maybe 0 0.1 and we're saying instead of making an uh, update when y times w transpose x is less than zero i want you to make an update when y times w transpose x is less than eta in other words not only when it's negative but even if it's positive but less than eta you need to make an update because i'm going to count this as a mistake also and it turns out that this also can generalize better it has interesting connections as we will see much much later to support vector machines um, and uh, but there's an intuitive reason for why the margin perceptron might be a good idea any thoughts on this yes to take care of noise to take care of noise but can you give me a sort of a mechanical answer uh, an answer that essentially talks about hyperplanes and such things sorry no i see what you mean i see what you mean there's like a uh, so the we have w transpose x is uh, greater than or equal to b is the bias but we have we are multiplying by y here so uh, so there's like a little bit more than that Yes. Right. So the, basically, you're changing the. Uh, you, you have both of you have the uh, right intuition. Originally, I said the hyper the the perceptron algorithm makes a mistake when. Let me draw a picture because it's kind of a nice picture to draw. If this is your line. And the uh, positive is everything on this side, and negative is everything on the other side. And everything you can get arbitrarily close to the line. And if you are positive on a positive example, it's still right. And if you are negative on the neg for a negative example, arbitrarily close, you're still right. What the margin perceptron does is it introduces this band on both sides of thickness eta. So really this is two times eta and it says i'm introducing this sort of a margin of safety on both sides of the hyperplane so that it's not enough to be on the correct side you need to, for it to be correct it needs to be on the correct side and far enough away otherwise maybe a future example will also be like this one and just be slightly off and it's going to be a mistake so i want to introduce this margin of safety that's the intuition here. Margin perceptron is also easy to implement. What you get in exchange for this is one extra hyperparameter, eta, and uh, you're going to implement this in your homework also. Okay, so that's all the variants of the perceptron algorithm uh, we want, I'm going to discuss right now. There's one more in your homework called the uh, aggressive update. Aggressive, uh, the aggressive perceptron is. Uh, um is a um, is an algorithm that was introduced around early 2000s 
this is in a, in a paper called Online Passive Aggressive Learning or something like that. Kind of a nice paper and uh, I, I recommend that you read it. But going back to the history, the percentile algorithm was invented in 1958, or at least with this name. Almost immediately after the percentile algorithm came along, there was this incredible hype. Um, it, there was uh, articles in New York Times, there was an article in New Yorker. Um, I really found this, uh, the New Yorker, the New York Times article to be so interesting. It says here that uh, the Navy unveils this algorithm that it expects to be to walk, talk, see, write, reproduce, and be conscious of its existence. I know, right? It's just in, it's incredible. 1959, I think this was, and uh, 58. And um, they are still talking about that same update rule that we just saw, you know, the one that kind of turns around the hyperplanes. Um, that they expect to be uh, conscious of its own existence and so on. This was implemented on an IBM 704 machine. I have never seen an IBM 704 machine. Almost certain that none of you have, so I had to look it up. Um, it looks like that thing at the side. Um, doesn't resemble anything that we might think of as a computer. This is more like from the original Star Trek uh, version of a computer where it just looks like a bunch of knobs. But the reason I'm bringing this up is this language that we are seeing in the press is very similar to the kind of stuff that we see about AI in the press today. Um, we see tweets, not New York Times, but tweets, and maybe even in New York Times about a model that has become conscious. Uh, and you might think this is a new thing. Uh, it's not. This, this uh, AI has a tendency to kind of, when it works just a little bit, people think it works a lot and then write it up and then they get disappointed by it. Just be aware of that. What you need to know for this lecture is what the perceptron algorithm is, what the geometry of this update is, what's happening in the high dimensional space and intuition, what kinds of functions the perceptron can represent. We're still learning a linear classifier, so it can represent whatever linear classifiers can represent. And uh, you need to know a bunch of these variants of the perceptron algorithm so, to the extent that you can implement them on data sets of your own. Any questions? Yes. Yes. Uh -huh. Right. So you want that. So instead, you don't update A, you construct this other, you keep track of this other vector, let's call it V, and you update V whenever right here. And then you don't have this line. And instead, you compute A as a function of the vector V and the current weight. And there's a, it's basically you construct the average by keeping track of only the deltas that are needed to construct the average. So the V essentially is asking how much change should I make to the original one? That's, an, that's literally just an optimization. It doesn't change the technical content. Yes. Uh, I don't know how you know that, but uh, I can tell you how you can uh, uh, kind of debug this implementation. Debugging machine learning code is maybe some of you have noticed it's a nightmare. Mm -hmm. um, it gets even worse when your algorithm has randomness in it. So for debugging, pieces of advice. First, Always set the random seed so that the second time you run it, you, you your program goes through the same steps again. Because you don't want your program to do different things each time and then you're still trying to fix a bug. That's like a sure shot way to kind of grow old early. Um, the second idea for debugging, which I have had to use quite often, is think about the properties of the algorithm and the properties of the classifier that you're learning. What we know here is that the perceptron can learn a linear classifier, right? It can learn any linear classifier as we will see in a minute, which means 
that if you construct a tiny data set that is linearly separable, then your perceptron should learn to classify the correct person. If it does not, then there's a bug. How tiny? I've had uh, uh, luck constructing data sets of size with two dimensions, like uh, you know the kind of things that you see in your homework, two or three dimensions. Just construct a data set, give it your code, see what happens. If it fails, you can actually step through the code to see because with the tiny data set, you can actually write down the update on paper. You can keep track of what should happen. There are with two dimensions, there are only four examples, so there are like four weight factors it's going to go through. Maybe a few times, so maybe four or maybe eight or no more than 20 or 20, uh, 30 updates. So you can actually enumerate through this process and see if your code is uh, producing a linear class, a linear, if your data is linearly separable. If not, there's a bug. Another thing to do is you can also check if you're, if, because it's a linear classifier, you know that certain data sets, certain concepts are not linearly separable. You construct one that's not linearly separable. If your algorithm learns it, you know that's a bug, right? If it cannot represent it, it cannot learn it. So that's another sort of a test case. A final thing, or maybe the first, second thing to try after setting the random seed is to make sure that you have a bias feature. Common mistake with perceptron is people forget to add a bias feature when you're implementing it. Standard implementations of these things internally always have a bias. So in your implementation, make sure you have a bias feature. If you forget it, chances are you will get uh, a worse classifier. But really stepping through code on a data set where you control everything is the best way of debugging. In the, as we move along, I'll give you other strategies for debugging involving certain quantities you can keep track of as learning proceeds. We are not quite there yet, so we'll get to that later. Yes. With uh, high enough dimensionality, everything is linearly separable. So I don't know how they did play chess or if they play chess. Um, does it say it plays chess? Oh yeah, uh, it depends on the features. If you have the right features, it's gonna be good. I actually don't know how, what they implemented, so can't really be sure. We have about um, 12 minutes left, and I would like to at least get started with this perceptron mistake bond. Because the perceptron mistake bond is such a cool result. And, uh, you know, after you see the proof and you kind of internalize it, it seems obvious, but the big picture of it is so interesting. So I want to be able to state the mistake bound at least, not maybe and prove it in the next lecture. So we've seen the perceptron, we've seen variants, we're proving a mistake bound about the original perceptron algorithm, the one that uh, Rosenblatt invented. There are a couple of theorems that talk about the convergence of the convergence properties of this algorithm. Uh, the first one, which is the uh, which is the one that we'll uh, uh, we'll prove, is uh, called the convergence theorem. If there exists a set of weights that consistent with the data, in other words, if a data set is linearly separable, then the perceptron algorithm will converge. What does converge mean? It means it will eventually stop making mistakes because that's the only way in which the perceptron updates the weight. So there will be no more updates. There's also the cycling theorem, which I mentioned a little while earlier, which some of you may have noticed in the little animation that I showed. If the data is not linearly separable, the learning algorithm will kind of repeat, will get into this infinite loop where it keeps uh, you know, giving us the same set of weights again and again. So it will kind of loop through a fixed set of weight vectors. I'll not be proving this. Now, the reason the perceptron learnability is such a big deal is uh, because of the history of the uh, of the um, the perceptron uh, classifier, the learner itself, all that hype in the nineteen in late fifties was followed up by these two theorems. Actually, it's the same theorem with, from two different people, Novikov and Dwak, which we will look at in a minute. That showed that the perceptron algorithm is going to will eventually stop making mistakes. That only fueled the hype even more. But unfortunately, the perceptron algorithm cannot learn what it cannot represent. And this was made kind of very, uh, this argument was made rather forcefully uh, um, 
by this book called Positrons from Minsky and Papert, who used tools of geometry to analyze the positron and its behavior. They wrote this book called Positrons that is super influential at that time. It showed, among other things, that this algorithm, which is supposed to walk and talk and reproduce and get conscious and all that, cannot even represent the XOR function. We know that, right? Because it cannot, XOR is not linearly separable. So it cannot learn the XOR function. But at that time, when it was put in sharp contrast against the hype, it, it, it was a bit jarring. This book is, um, so the XOR function is special because XOR allows us to in computer vision, or you know, in just in visual uh, uh, processing, the XOR function can be seen as representing properties like symmetry or connectivity of certain regions and such things. And we don't have to go into the details, but essentially what this book said is because the perceptron cannot learn the XOR, it cannot represent concepts that are so intuitive for us, like symmetry. And when I said this book was influential, what it is supposed to have done is it essentially killed US government research funding for AI for like a good decade. Um, and then this, this is one of the reasons, not the only, but one of the reasons that led to what is called the first AI winter, um, where Basically, AI became a topic that you really don't want to do research on. If you're a grad student working on AI, you get sympathy. Um, and uh, you know, the, then, then eventually things got better and things got worse again, and then things got better. We are in that third summer. Um, so the perceptron mistake bound, um, which we will talk about now, was a concrete, a, a formal mathematical, is a formal mathematical statement about the behavior of the target. And it hinges crucially on this concept called the margin. So if you have a hyperplane like this line here and a, and a particular um, data set like these pluses and minus, if the data set is linearly separable, the margin of the hyperplane for the data is the distance to the closest point. How far is any point in the data set to that hyperplane. It's an intuitive idea, right? I mean, ideally, you want the margin to be large because you want no point to be anywhere in the vicinity so that you don't accidentally end up making mistakes. There's also this idea called the margin of a data set. So for a data set, I can consider every possible hyperplane. You know, every this is a hyperplane that separates the data set with positive on this side. This is another one positive on this side. Uh, this is another almost. If if you believe that that's a line, <laughs> there. This is a hyperplane that separates everything correctly, and then there's a blue one also. All of these separate the data set correctly. Among all of these, we can ask what's the margin for each one of them. So for um, this one, the margin is here. Can you see what I'm when I'm drawing this? Or should let me zoom in. So for this line here, this distance is the closest. For this line here, this distance is the closest. For this line, the positive example is the closest. The one in the middle has the largest margin. Right? For every, I can throw in like infinite number of lines that separate out the positive and the negative. And I can ask which one of them has the maximum distance between the any data point. That maximum distance is called the margin of the data. The idea of a margin is a fundamentally important concept that keeps coming up in machine learning. So I will kind of uh, discuss this multiple times through which, uh, you know, talk about what it means mathematically and all that, but I want you to kind of get a gut feeling for what it is. So any questions about margins? It's simply the, the margin of a data set is simply the, the, uh, the maximum possible margin that any hyperplane can create, can have for that data set. And what's the margin of a hyperplane for a data set? It's simply the distance to the closest data points. Yes. Does the data set that is not linearly separable have the margin 
No. Um, the, we are defining it for a separable data set. When the data set is not linearly separable, we will um, talk about what is what margin could I create if I were allowed to toss out some examples. Yes. With the perceptron? Yes. No. We will not. In fact, um, there's no guarantee of that happening. That's the difference between a perceptron and an SVM. A support vector machine is simply a, more, a learning algorithm that doesn't care about anything else except maximizing the margin. Yes. Is it correct to say that um, uh, our data set got a strong signal kind of barrier about hypothesis space? Like, how well posed it is depending on the data set? Not quite, right? I mean, I could construct an artificial task. That has a fantastically clean, uh, you know, the behavior from these points of view. So just because it's linearly separable does not mean the problem is well posed. Just right? Does that make sense? Yeah. Learnability does not mean credibility. Yes. Uh, I'm going to say yes, but I don't want to discuss it in more detail because then um, then you'll ask me to prove it and then I'll have to talk about VC dimensions and we'll have to go through the entire next few weeks of class in the next five minutes. So we'll get there. We have three minutes left and that's pretty much enough time for me to state the perceptron mistake bound. And then we'll I'll restate it at the beginning of the next lecture and we can pick up from there. The perceptron mistake bond theorem is uh, uh, from was independently uh, proved by Novikov and Bloch. So sometimes it's called the Novikov theorem or the Novikov Bloch theorem. Imagine that you have a sequence of training examples x1, y1, x2, y2 um, that keeps going. Each example xi is some n-dimensional vector, and we are assuming. Well, we're not assuming that we are. We're just saying that every example xi has uh, it's a vector, right? The length of the vector is less than some r. There has to be some number that is big enough such that the, the example is, uh, all examples are have a length less than r, right? We have a finite data set, just find the farthest point from the origin and draw a big circle. Now, we can always find such an r. Why? Because, like I said, you have a finite data set. I, from the origin, I find the farthest point and I, I, I construct a ball that's big enough to contain the entire data. I can make the ball arbitrarily big. R can be a really large number, but I can find some R that has this property. So this, the point I'm trying to make here is Xi, all Xi less being less than R is not an assumption. It's some R. We don't get to, we don't necessarily, uh, we're not saying much about what that R is. Now, suppose you have some unit vector U such that um, for and a, and a positive number gamma says that y u transpose x is always greater than or equal to gamma for every example in the training data. What that means is for every training example, what if y u, u transpose xi is greater than zero, that means u is not going to make a mistake. Remember, mistake means negative. Y u transpose x is negative. Here it's saying not only is it not making a mistake, it's actually greater than gamma. So gamma is like your margin. So the data is separable with a margin gamma. Uh, gamma is your is, is a parameter that dictates how difficult the task is. If gamma is really small, then all the points are going, then the positive and negatives are going to be really close to each other. If this happens, then the perceptron algorithm will make no more than r square over gamma square mistakes on this training sequence. That's the entirety of the theorem. Um, if you hadn't been a unit vector, then the bound will change to the, the you will show up in the final bound. We won't we don't have to worry about that. But this is a lot of notation. And it's kind of unfair of me to toss this at you at the very last minute of the lecture. So here is a, a compressed version of it. Suppose we have a binary classification data set with n-dimensional inputs. If the data is linearly separable, 
then the perceptron algorithm will find a separating hyperplane after making only a finite number of mistakes. This is the cool part. It doesn't matter what sequence it is. After making a finite number of mistakes, the perceptron algorithm will stop making mistakes forever again. We'll stop here. And uh, in the next lecture, I'm going to restate this theorem and then uh, we'll look at a proof.